phillystartupleaders.org presents the 2010 Founder Factory Conference, recorded November 17, 2010, at the World Cafe Live in Philadelphia. Brought to you by Morgan Lewis, providing comprehensive transactional, litigation, labor and employment, and intellectual property legal services to clients of all sizes, from global Fortune 100 companies to just conceived startups across all major industries on the web at morganlewis.com and by Chariot Solutions, an IT consulting firm specializing in application development and systems integration using Java and open source technologies on the web at chariotsolutions.com and by Cone Partners, an independent insurance brokerage that delivers integrated solutions to meet client needs in business, benefits, life, and personal insurance. Also by Monetate, the leading independent provider of testing, targeting, and personalization for websites. On the web at monetate.com. And by Leadnomics, an industry leader in lead generation and performance marketing. On the web at leadnomics.com. In this episode, Fishball Number 2, Scalability, with presentations by Urban Escapes and Greenfire. My name is uh, Christina Martin Graysman. I'm uh, head of business development for DDC. Uh, you heard my boss, uh, Fareed, speak uh, this morning. And um, yeah, he's an interesting, as interesting as he was to listen to speak to, he's even more interesting to work for. So it is uh, my pleasure to get to introduce the, uh, the next uh, fishbowl. And we have two companies um, in the uh, fishbowl this time, uh, Urban Escapes and, and Green Fire, and I'll just uh, give you a little background on the topic, which is business scalability. And growing a company without sacrificing quality or uh, exponentially increasing costs is a business problem that a lot of CEOs uh, stay up at night worrying about. And you've got to figure out how to leverage your resources and the ability to increase market share um, soon enough to meet market demands. And so in, in short, when it starts to rain money, um, you better have an ever-expanding bucket or you're going to be in a lot of trouble. So the two companies, uh, Greenfire and Urban Escapes, are going to talk a little bit about their experiences uh, in that area. Greenfire is a clinical, clinical trials technology company, and they provide e-payment and communication solutions that they customize to meet the individual needs of their clients. They've combined a proprietary technology platform that unites electronic payments and real-time communication tools. And that results in a very dynamic payment and communication product um, that helps their clients increase retention, enrollment, and compliant compliance rates uh, faster and more efficiently uh, than previous methods. All of their products are designed to continually build loyalty between the product's end user, which are the patients and the investigators, um, and Greenfire's clients and their trials. The other company is Urban Escapes, um, and this is a very compelling story of uh, business scalability. Two and a half years ago, Maya was organizing trips for her friends. She might be doing camping one weekend, a skydiving trip the next weekend, and soon friends of friends were calling and saying, hey, you know, can I come on these trips as well? And um, before long, she was planning a trip every weekend, and uh, after a successful summer of sold-out trips, it was clear that this was more than a hobby and, and Urban Escapes was born. And the vision of Urban Escapes was to bring adventure travel to every urban area around the country. So shortly thereafter, their kind of unique business model and brand caught fire. They started to grow very quickly. They were struggling to meet demand, and um, you know, but that was a great, a great problem to have. So they um, planned to scale nationwide, and as they were growing, they connected with Living Social, who many of you may have heard of. It's the uh, social shop shopping site. Uh, they took notice of Urban Escapes, ended up acquiring them, and now Urban Escapes is building out the uh, National and International Adventures Division. So uh, with this acquisition, Living Social and Urban Escapes are taking social adventures to the next level, um, making them even uh, bigger and better than before. So uh, without further ado, I will bring on uh, Gil and uh, the rest of the, uh, the panelists and the uh, fishbowl companies. Thanks. So wonderful. So I'd like to introduce the panelists today uh, for the business scalability uh, uh, 
fishbowl. So we have Adam Schramm of, of um, Incentive, um, and um, he spoke on the, uh, uh, the art of the pivot. Next, we have Jeff Bodel, who's a partner at the very entrepreneur-friendly Morgan Lewis. Nick Arocco, founder and CEO of the CFO Alliance and Achieve Next. And then I'd like to bring on, uh, on stage uh, Sam Whitaker is the founder and CEO of Greenfire. Prior to Greenfire, Sam was the VP uh, in the product development group uh, of Citigroup's prepaid card division. Sam was responsible for managing existing products and developing new payment solutions. Prior to Citigroup, Sam worked in transactional finance, both as an investment banker and as a member of the investment team of a Philadelphia-based holding company. Sam earned a BA from the University of Pennsylvania. Now, Maya Josephbachvili is the founder and CEO of Urban Escapes, which exited to Living Social and now serves as the national director for, social, uh, for Living Social Escapes. Maya graduated from Dartmouth College with a degree in, anybody want to guess? Mechanical engineering. Uh, and went on to be a derivatives trader on Wall Street for two years. She quit her trading job to travel around the, the world for a year, visiting over 40 countries on six continents. Maya recently returned to New York City to start Urban Escapes and shared her love and passion for the outdoors with fellow New Yorkers. So I'd like to, to start off by um, asking Sam to, to take the podium and discuss a little bit about uh, some of the, the challenges and successes he's had with business scalability and also perhaps open up a problem that maybe we can further discuss. So thank you. Thanks. Um, so I was thinking about how to start this and I figured I'd relate it to the Founders Factory um, since that seems to be obvious. Uh, we started, John Samar and I, well, two of the three co-founders started the company about two, a little over two years ago. Um, and so one of the things that we did early on was we came to the first Founders Factor and we sat here and what we had at the time was um, a concept and we had two willing employees, uh, me and him. Um, but we didn't have a working product, we didn't have a client, we didn't have any revenue, um, but we were convinced that everything was going to work just fine. Um, and, uh, and so what we did was we, we obviously started to try and put things into motion. Um, in May of 2009, we got our first client, they launched their first, um, their first program with us, and then since then, we man have managed to get over 50 clients, um, along with uh, about a million and a quarter in revenue this year. Um, so that's been you know, about a year and a half since we launched. Um, and so how did we get from sitting in a room with a concept and idea to having you know, 50 clients uh, in both the US and Europe, um, and then being able to both you know, have, maintain quality, service our clients, and then service end users? Um, well, so you know, I think that there's kind of three um, aspects of our business. So maybe just to give you a little bit more background, our company is specifically designed to offer solutions to the clinical research industry. So it's pharma companies, biotechs, medical device companies that are our clients. Um, and so we look at our business, and it's also kind of centralized. So we all sit in an office um, and we operate uh, kind of in a semi-global fashion uh, from outside of King of Prussia. Um, what we thought of is that we needed to do three things. We needed to um, sell. So you know, at first, JP and I you know, did basically everything ourselves and that wasn't going to be scalable. So we needed to figure out people to bring on board that were going to be able to get clients to sign contracts and bring on new business. And then we needed to produce. Um, so when we promise something to a client, we need to be able to deliver it and deliver it well. Um, and then, so those are like kind of the two divisions in our company. Um, in order to do that, we needed to put in place the right people, uh, so to get, you know, kind of a, an A team, I guess. Uh, that wasn't going to screw it up for us, uh, especially early on, because our first couple clients were um, our best, you know, obviously our best uh, advocates for the second, third, fourth client. Um, and then we also needed processes, so that you know, not so much for the first client, because we you can dedicate all of our time, but when we get 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 clients, we need to have some significant, you know, and kind of meaningful processes in place, so that the production. Uh, people would be able to to operate in an efficient way, and that may that also included developing some applications internally that made those jobs more efficient. Um, and so since then, we you know not everything's been as smooth as it might seem 
you know, me t speaking to you guys right now, you know, we have made some errors in hires, hiring. Fortunately, not too many, but we've had a couple of, um, of you know, faults that were probably my own, and um, and we have had hiccups with our technology that we have to manage to figure out a way to to fix on the fly, uh, especially in such a way that our client doesn't realize it, or at least it seems minimal to our client, so that they don't lose faith in us or confidence. Um, and so I think that, you know, and then ultimately we, you know, we have to develop processes um, in order to, to try and minimize errors or, or you know, foul-ups. Uh, I think that one of the challenges that we've faced is being proactive about doing these things. So um, not so much knowing that we need to do these things. You know, we know that we need to do a lot of things at some point, but when do we put them in place? You know, when do we hire a new project manager so that our current project manager's you know, head doesn't explode and... Um, and she drops the ball on a couple of different, you know, project implementations. Um, you know, how do we know when to hire another developer? Um, and then, uh, you know, how do we know when to put a process in place? And so we've been more reactive, I think, um, in general to this point where, you know, we put a process in place when something gets screwed up and we say, how do we avoid this in the future? Well, we're going to follow a, a rigid process to make sure that, you know, we don't make the same mistake twice. Um, or how do we know when to hire a project manager? So same kind of thing happened where I was basically acting as a product project manager at first. When I couldn't, you know, my bandwidth got too much, then we decided we've got to hire someone. So what we've, what we've tried to do is, is track metrics or data. So we now we, we can recognize when our pipeline gets to, or we're starting to realize better, when our sales pipeline gets to a certain point, we might need to hire a new project manager to um, anticipate, you know, implementation demand. Or... Um, when we, we know how many uh, development projects we have going on at a single time and we have them prioritized and when the prioritized items get to be you know, too many, we'll hire a developer. Um, so that makes it sound like we have it all figured out, but uh, the truth being, we don't. You know, we're, every day there's, or every you know, week or month there's another issue or, or problem that presents itself to us that we are developing a process for, uh, we have to hire someone for, um, or we need to you know, think on the fly and problem solve so that you know, one, we solve the problem now so that uh, our client isn't impacted, but two, we can put, uh, we can put uh, checks and balances in place so that it doesn't happen in the future. Um, I guess that's all I really have uh, as an introduction, but I'll let you go. Great, hello, there you go. Great, thank you very much. So maybe you can still stay up there for a moment. We're gonna grill you for another few minutes here. Oh, sure. Um, turn up the, the lights there and make it hot for them. So may, maybe, Sam, you can chat a little bit about um, some of the scalability surprises that you had. So some of the things that, that you hadn't anticipated in your original business plan, some areas, and, and it could be you know, a good surprise or maybe a bad surprise as you, your business began to grow. Um, well, I think that uh, the biggest surprise that I had uh, was probably not, I mean, it was a horrible surprise. Um, and so we were, we were just getting ready to, to launch our first client, uh, which was, you know, in our mind, you know, if, if we do well on this, we will get a second client. And if we don't, then we are going to be, you know, in a rough place. Um, and we were about three weeks into it, and we had one developer that we... Um, you know, on our staff, there was three of us basically, um, and the developer decided to ask us for you know more money, um, an inordinate amount of equity, and a bunch of other demands that the individual asked for, um, or he was going to quit um, that day or you know the next week or whatever. And so JP and neither of us are programmers; we can't pick up from where uh, he left off. And if he left, then. Um, uh, our first client wasn't going to launch. It was going to be a big disaster in our, you know, our company. I felt at the time, anyway, that our company was going to go under. Um, so how did, we, how did we end up handling that situation? Uh, we managed to manage expectations with our employee in such a way that he didn't quit, thank God, uh, although he did quit eventually a couple weeks later. Um, <laughs> but it was after the, the work had been done. Um, and then we recognized that there was an issue um, in our company. And we were three people, so there's a lot of risk, right? Um, and that was, uh, and our solution was to build redundancies uh, in, in some of our functionality or, or, you know, in our staff. So what we did then was we went out and hired two developers that were equally um, skilled. Uh, and now we have three of them. Um, so if one of them quits, 
it certainly won't be um, you know, a, a pleasant experience, especially because our, our guys are really good. Uh, but, um, but at least our company is not going to go under, um, or we're not going to be able to, or we won't have to call our clients and say, you know, listen, you know, we just can't deliver this anymore because we need to hire a developer. Um, and I think that that's kind of a privilege or a you know, benefit that we have now of you know, some revenue coming in and some, you know, some dollars hitting our bank account. Whereas in the past, you know, when we first started, you know, there probably wasn't a whole lot of uh, budget for us to hire two, three, four developers you know, from the start just to build a redundancy. But um, I think that that was probably the biggest surprise. Kind of good. So uh, I'm going to open it up to the, to the panelists in a second. Uh, but could you comment a little bit about sort of the, the scalability as it relates to, I mean, you're, you're working in a very sensitive area, clinical trials, right? And if there's a bug in your code or something, somebody could die, right? And so um, is there an additional pressure you have as you scale your business to, to make sure that, that um, you do it right um, and, uh, and, and nobody dies? Well, fortunately, I don't think anyone would die. Um, uh, but, um, you know, I think that um, uh, we kind of think of our clients like that. And um, as we, you know, I think we've had a very good um, experience with client feedback, and it's been very positive. Um, and I think that we, you know, we take steps to, um, uh, to kind of control the, the development process, or like when we're going to launch, you know, a new feature or functionality, we go through... Um, you know, a process, albeit, you know, at the moment it's, you know, somewhat loose, but all of the components are there with, you know, design, development, testing, and, and some control to make sure that when um, this new feature is pushed, it's not going to make the whole system crash, and, and all of our clients are going to have, you know, a couple of days where they're, you know, really hurting, and, and it degrades our opin their opinion of us. Um, so there's definitely a quality management perspective. And, you know, the downside to that is that, you know, as we start to put these processes in place in order to, um, in, you know, ensure quality and, and kind of scale our business up, it slows things down. Um, so what used to be, you know, oh, new client, you know, our first client, you want a new um, approval process. Oh, sure, we'll build that for you. Yeah, it'll be ready in three weeks. Um, and then I go back to the developers and say, you know, hey, can we get this done in three weeks? Um, you know, now it's, it's much more of a, oh, you want something new, let me go and talk to these guys, we'll scope it out, design it, build it, uh, test it, and then push it to production. Now, it's not quite that controlled, you know, at the moment, but it's, it's getting there. First off, uh, congratulations on your success to date. Well, I'm going to skip the Monday morning quarterback type question and ask you maybe a current state question that will lend itself to a future state question. So um, I'm going to assume you don't have any clients or customers in the room, am I right? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. All how of many, my clients raise How many hand. of the 50 are, are, are or were on your kind of top 50 list of, and what kind of process are you implementing that touches on all the areas of your business in, and strategy as it relates to evaluating that 50 and looking to the next 50? Um, well, I think one of the fortunate things that we have going for us in our business and in our industry is that um, there's really only a hundred clients in the you're sense that halfway there. That's yeah, awesome. right. Well, so a hundred clients meaning, you know, a hundred companies. But within each company, there are many buyers of our of our products. So, you know, if you take like a big one like Pfizer, for example, um, we can't just make one sale to Pfizer and then that's it and we're all good. We have to, you know, make fifty, a hundred sales to, you know, fifty or a hundred different groups within Pfizer. Um, so what we do is, uh, you know, all almost all of Almost all of our, our clients now were in our original top list of we'd love to have these guys as clients. Some of them popped out and we didn't know who they were uh, beforehand. Um, but what we do now is we, uh, we will launch a first program with one of our clients. Um, and then after about you know, a month or two, so we basically put a, like a process in place. After you know, a month or two of successful execution and we have a, a team at the client that is, is very happy with us and is an internal champion, we will ask our, our client, which is probably a project management group, um, to set up meetings for us with their peers um, or their, you know, their colleagues who are other buyers of our, of our you know, solution. Um, and so to date, you know, we've done a great job and we do a great job with customer service. All of our clients have been very happy and, and even felt invested in our success within the company. Um, so they will have us out. We'll do like group presentations where we have you know, 20 other project teams in the room um, and then we slowly can penetrate within each um, pharma company that way. 
You alluded a little bit to the technology challenges that you faced. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about, did you anticipate those technology challenges early on, and what are you doing to address them now going forward? Um, so I would say that all of the um, kind of technology-driven challenges of our business, we didn't anticipate um, until they happened. Um, although, you know, we do do testing to, to, you know, make sure that as many bugs as possible are worked out. But, um, you know, as you know, probably most of you know, you know, there will always be, you know, some bugs that pop up that you didn't catch. Hopefully that reduces as you get bigger. But, um, you know, I think it's been a, a little bit of a, a challenge to develop our problem solving skills. Um, so something will pop up, you know, might pop up, might pop up right now while I'm talking that I don't even know about right now. Um, and so we have to figure out a quick way to solve the problem. Um, so either, you know, one of our developers, you know, figures out a great way to, to solve a bug, or uh, JP and I come up with a strategy to make sure that our only developer doesn't quit, you know, two weeks before uh, we're supposed to launch our first client. Um, and so I think that when we, JP and I talk about kind of managing unexpected um, uh, situations, I think we always kind of go back to the, the fact that, you know, as entrepreneurs, uh, we're not so much uh, in the business of creating a product and selling it, but we're more in the business of problem solving. Um, and I think that all of our success um, in terms of fixing unexpected issues has come back all the way back down to the fundamental of us being, you know, decent problem solvers um, and doing that in a way that doesn't impact our business in a, in a super negative way or at all. This is a hot mic? Okay. Uh, how, how can I put this? Um, you seem conflicted about problems in general. Uh, they asked me to be provocative, so going with that, tell me if you want me to stop, though. Um, no, go ahead. Okay. Uh, I, I can hear you saying things that indicate to me that you realize you're getting paid to solve problems. You know, it's your job. But I'm also hearing um, what may be internal programming come out that you feel like problems are a bad thing. And as I work with entrepreneurs, I realize that they kind of fall into two camps. The kind that are oppressed by their problems and downtrodden and the kind that are confident problem solvers. And I've realized that people get paid according to the size of the problems they're solving. So if you want to make an income, you got to take on bigger and bigger problems. And I see that some entrepreneurs kind of get downtrodden and it kills their confidence and they kind of are kind of wah-wah about it. And other ones fall into the bring it on camp. And I'm not hearing bring it on. I'm hearing wah-wah. Is this making sense? Um, I think so. And I think yeah. that in my mind, what I'm thinking of are, you know, unexpected problems where we thought, you know, we had already solved the problem. But, oh, yeah, so um, unexpected problems feel dangerous to you yeah. on some level. Uh, sure, uh, yeah. especially because we're, you know, we're small and we, we still have this mentality of, you know, are we going to, you know, mm -hmm. be able to pay our bills? Uh, although, I, I mean, I think that that is basically carried over from the days where, you know, we were burning cash and we weren't, you know, kind of break even or, or cash flow positive. When we come up, I mean, I think that when we enter into the product development realm of what we do, um, that's kind of where we, you know, we, we focus on solving big problems. So we look at our clients, we talk with them, and find out, you know, what are the biggest pain points in their, in their business? And then we say, you know, we can solve this. Uh, and then it. we go back to the whiteboard and come up with a solution. All right, so you make your living in problem solving. My, my diagnosis is that unexpected problems are hanging you up. You're hung up on them. And so I, I don't like them. What's that? Sure. Yeah, I don't like unexpected okay. problems. The prescription is to uh, consider a new belief structure that incorporates a belief that uh, we'll do our best to handle and anticipate what may be an unexpected problem if we didn't do that, but they're guaranteed to come along. They're guaranteed. So if you spend your entire career resisting unexpected problems, you're going to get upset and downtrodden. But the bring it on camp, their belief system says um, problems are always going to happen. We can do our best to anticipate them, but we're only human. And, you know, we're going to reach out and do all the things we can do to anticipate them. But they're going to happen. They're a guarantee. We get paid according to the size of our, of our unexpected problems. The bigger they are, the more we're going to get paid. Hmm. So that's a prescription. Interesting. Great. Well, thank you very much, Sam. And uh, with that, I'd love to, to bring up Maya. Hello. So, uh, I think I'm going to start with how this whole thing started, because I think that that is kind of the epitome of scale. Um, it didn't start as a scalable thing at all, and I think I've been dealing with scale for the last three years now. So, it actually all started sophomore year of college. I 
agreed to, like in the middle of a beer pong game, to go skydiving the next day with 10 other people who were going at 8 a.m. And I wake up in the morning and I find myself in a car going skydiving with you know, these kids I was playing beer pong with the night before. And we get back down and I was just like, wow, that was the most incredible thing I've ever done in my whole entire life. I want to be a professional skydiver. Uh, but it's not cheap to be a professional skydiver. So I pull the owner aside of the drop zone and I was like, hey, I want to be a skydiver, but I can't afford it. So how can I skydive for free? Like, there's got to be some exchange. Like, can I do marketing for you? Can I bring you tandems? And he thinks about it, and he's like, OK. He's like, yeah, I need more tandem students. Like, you're connected to the college. He's like, bring me tandems, and you'll skydive for free. And we'll just create some exchange system, you know, like x dollars for x tandem students who bring. And I was like, OK. So I go back home, and I take the whole entire mailing list of Dartmouth College, and I emailed everyone. And I was like, hey, guys, I started a skydiving company. We take people skydiving. Uh, email me if you want to go. And I sent weekly emails. And within like two months, I had taken a couple hundred people skydiving and did like my first 100 jumps for free with the drop zone. Uh, which was not what he was expecting at all, but I think he was happy in the end. But the point is, I realized, I was like, oh, cool. Like, this is how I can do things that I want to do if I can't afford them. I just get big groups to go, and I get to go for free. So fast forward, I finished college. I do what you know, you're supposed to do, and I went and worked on Wall Street for two years, um, which was awesome, but I could never get out on weekends. So I took the same concept I had before, and I was like, well, I'm just going to do it again, but for everything else. So one weekend, I'd be like, all right, whitewater rafting, who wants to go? I'd get a group of like 20 people, we'd all go rafting, and I'd go for free. And then, you know, the next weekend it'd be like camping and hiking, who wants to go camping? And I'd get a group, and again, like, you know, I got to go for free. Uh, and friends of friends started coming on trips, and friends of friends of friends started coming on my trips. And I remember one night, like, probably a year into me just like doing these random trips on weekends, uh, we're sitting around the campfire, and all these people like didn't know each other, didn't know me, and they were just like, this is actually really awesome, because it's kind of a business. You should leave Wall Street and do this full time. And I literally thought about it for like a day. <laughs> I said, you're right, I should. So uh, I left Wall Street and I wrote some sort of business model and I started Urban Escapes, which was my you know, extension of my skydiving career in college. Uh, and then I guess let's just fast forward. Urban Escapes started as like a hiking and camping company in New York. I quickly realized that there's a lot more that people want to do and so Within the first year, we were doing things like hike and yoga. We were doing our franchise trip, which is now our most uh, biggest seller, which is uh, shooting and drinking. Uh, I think some people here might have even been on that trip. Um, and I mean, really, like we did like 40 different types of trips. Within like the first year and a half, I realized that this model is actually really cool and probably applies to every city, not just New York. So uh, I talked to my business partner, who I brought on six months in. And I was like, we should do this in other cities. And he's like, yeah, what do you want to start with? I was like, let's start with Boston. And he's like, well, it's probably like X amount of work to do Boston. And it's probably only 2X to do Boston, Philly, and DC. So let's just do three cities instead of one. And I was like, yeah, it makes sense. <laughs> you know, why not? So we launched uh, three other cities. This is like a year ago now. Um, and took the same model and tried to create, replicate the model in these other cities. Uh, and you know, our plan for world domination was every year to kind of build up a few more cities. Uh, now fast forward to two months ago, and Living Social, which is this you know, social shopping site, said, we love what you do. Uh, we think we can do it better and faster if we all do it together. Um, and by the way, we have a mailing list of 10 million people, and we're in 100 cities. And we were like, yeah, that probably makes sense. And so you know, after uh, six weeks of talks and deals and negotiations, we signed papers. And now it's been a month, and we are now literally just starting up the, uh, the Living Social Escapes chapter. And to give you a sense, like this year, we were, this is, so this is like year two and a half, as Urban Escapes, we were on track to do a revenue of like about a million dollars across our cities. Uh, we officially launched Living Social Escapes last Wednesday. Uh, so now we're literally at one week, uh, and we generated over a million in sales in one week. So. That's our, that's our scaling tenfold. And now, <laughs> thanks, um, which is cool. So now, I guess I want to talk about how I view scale, because um, I think we're in a really difficult industry to scale. Uh, it, it's not just like acquiring more users on your email list. I mean, we're actually putting on trips. So to take 10,000 people a year on trips, which is what we did last year, is awesome. 
but we want to take now, you know, 100,000 people on trips. And, like, that's not an easy thing to do. That's not just some formula you type into your computer and say, this is how we can get, like, a better customer acquisition number. So I guess the way I look at scales, first, I, I view it in four things, right? So first it's, like, what are you scaling? What do you want to scale? And we wanted to scale money because we weren't profitable yet. So when I was looking at scale, this is pre-acquisition, I said, okay, um, I want to make more money because we need to be able to pay salaries because otherwise there is no urban escapes. So that was my first thing. I was like, all right, I want to make more money so that I can pay off people and keep running this company. So then the next part of that was what I call like the do the math part, right? It's like, how much money do I want to make? Well, I want to pay off all my employees and take a salary myself. So I set some number. So then you take whatever margins you traditionally have, figure out what they're going to be, and figure out how much gross revenue you have to take in, right, to reach that number, those dollars that you want to get. So then you take your gross revenue, right, like this is how much money you need to bring in, and you divide by like the average cost of your product, which tells you, you know, how many products you have to sell. And then you like divide by 52 to see how many you have to sell in one week, or divide by 12 and see what you have to do in a month. And a lot of times I think people don't do that, and it's kind of intimidating once you see that number. You're like, oh wow, I have to do like a thousand people a weekend to get where I want to be, you know, so I think just like to have that goal is really important. So once you have the goal, um, it's like part three is like, can I even get there? Like, is my product scalable? And we found, like, once we did the math, we said no. Like, our current product, this is like two years ago now, is not scalable. These 15-person hikes and camping trips were like, I'm going out to the grocery store on Friday and, and buying all the food that we have to do, and then I'm packing it, and then I'm waking up at 6 a.m. to pack the van. Like, that is not a scalable model. We can't take that and get to the number we want to get. So you either charge more, which, like, sometimes or usually doesn't work, right? or you change your product a little bit. So we said, okay, well, the 15-person camping trips aren't great, but a 50-person shooting and drinking trip, like, yeah, okay, if we do a lot of those, that works better. So we had to change our product to make it more scalable. Um, so that's part three. And then the last one is, okay, so now you've got it. Like, you've got your product, you know how much you have to do, and you think you can get there. And then this is probably the biggest thing, and one thing that I think about every single day, is, is it still a good product? You know, like, did you conserve the quality of what your original product was in this whole scaling process? And this is probably a conversation that could last hours and hours, but I guess the way I view it is like the, the key to quality is the people you hire. I think you have to put so many resources into your recruiting, into your hiring, because like that's who's creating your product now. You know, you create your employees or, you know, help mold them into what you want them to do. And then they have to recreate the product that you made. So as long as you have great employees, I think that's at least like the first step to ensuring quality. Great, thank you very much. So I'd like to open up to the panelists here uh, for any questions or comments. Um, Nick? Well, first off, you clearly, you clearly have passion and, and vision and attention to detail to execute. And you touched on the last point, which for me I think is most relevant for this audience as they think about their businesses and what happens from a personal perspective. Um, tell me about the trigger moment where you realized that y it couldn't just be about you being there to create that experience, yeah. your decision and voice on it, your stamp on it, because you can control your stamp. Right. And you can say, throw me a curveball. I can, I can hit any ball out of the park. Uh, at this level, you know, talk to us about that. Uh, it's really scary, actually. Because especially, I mean, with everyone has their own thing. For us, it was like, you're trusting people to go and take these strangers skydiving and like it's my ass on the line you know what I mean like at the end of the day if something happens like that's it. it it's me so it is really scary and I think it just goes back to like who you hire and how much you trust the people that you hire uh, we had at the final thing like nine full-time people and 50 part-time guides uh, and we had to fire one person, that's it. Mm. And we were pretty strict about it, we were, you know, and we lost one full-time person because he had to go you know, get married and do that whole thing. A, a quick follow-up, are they yeah. clones of you or do they have their own flavor? Uh, both. Okay. You know, I think, some, I think some of me comes out and then I think like, they're better at some other stuff that I'm not great at. So a couple things, one, how did you find those people um, to, to be able to do that, to the clones, but quasi-clones, I guess. Um, two, how critical was the fact that you were able to scale in a few cities to your exit, your successful exit, which I'm sure a lot of entrepreneurs want to achieve in the room. And then uh, the last point would be, um, along the way, 
what were the, the real key challenges that you faced when you made the decision to scale, you know, deciding to go to a new city? Um, actually, if someone has the answer to how to find great people, I would love to know because uh, we just did. We're now trying to launch, by trying to, I mean, we are going to launch 25 cities in the next two months. Uh, and we need a lot of city managers. So we actually need a filling one if anyone knows of anyone. Um, I, I, this is the one I still don't know. Like, we, Living Social has this massive recruiting process, right, where like they get hundreds and hundreds of resumes a day. And then we just had our first hiring session where we flew in like 20 people to do like a full day of interviews. And of those, the ones we hired were all internal uh, referrals. So I guess right now my only thing, my only surefire thing is like the ones that work the best are the ones that come through your network or your network's networks, which is useful but not that useful because that's not scalable. So I don't know how to find great people really quickly, but <laughs> you know we're trying. Um, and key, and the hardest. Uh, well, I guess yeah. Uh, how how critical was it that you could scale to other cities for for the oh, yeah. successful exit? Uh, I think that was, that was probably like the most important part. Um, I think they saw us and and living social's big thing is like live hungry, you know, make aggressive moves, and they viewed us, you know, two years or not even like a year in deciding to go and expand to four cities with no funding. I think they were just like, yep, same values. Like this is, if they can do four, they can do 50. When you do such a good job framing the problem, you actually make it really hard for a panel to answer the question. <laughs> because, you know, we can't ask you too many probing questions without doing a deep dive, which could take days, you know, to handle all the aspects of your business. But uh, tell me again, what the heck did you do to make a million dollars? What buttons did you push? What, this past week? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, 10 million person mailing list and really great products. What, what, what were you selling? What was the offer? Uh, so How did, we, yeah, was it so a house list? What's that? Was it your house file or did you pay to get on the list? Uh, this is, what do you mean? House files, your internal list? Is that what you sent uh, this to? Was like, this is Living Social's mailing list. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's not your business? That's a separate business? Well, so Living Social acquired us. Okay. So now we get to use them as the marketing platform to sell our product. Okay, okay. Uh, so tapping into their list made you a million bucks. Yeah, but you know, <laughs> I mean, I would say on that's top, part on of top it. of all your stuff. Yeah, I think. I mean, I think the big thing is like refining and understanding what what sells, right? I mean, like we figure it out. Like we kind of know now what the secret sauce is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, but what what was the offer though that you put out? What what was the pitch um, on the list? We sold we sold seven different things around regions, and they were some of them were packaged hotels and spa retreats. Some of them were ski weekends, uh, and then the big one that we were really proud of is the Mexico. Retreat, so we put together like this awesome five-day Mexico trip for 450 bucks. Um, so, are there, are there spots still available? Uh, there are <laughs> spots still available. Okay, and so the, really the shooting fun. and drinking, what what are you shooting at? Uh, <laughs> what's the Philly one? The Philly one, I think you actually had to shoot machine guns. You're shooting machine guns. <laughs> yeah. At, at what? At beer cans. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. At uh, each other. So so here's part of like the scaling, right? Is I don't know what you shoot at in Philly. In the New York one, I know what you do. In the Philly one, you shoot machine guns at Targets. And then practice. Beth yeah. <laughs> at Targets. Okay, okay. When, when is the next one? <laughs> uh, the real question is, social. what are you drinking? <laughs> <laughs> and do you drink before, during, or after? Well, we have insurance, so after. That's great. After, okay, I, I have a real question. What What are you doing for virality? Getting people to recommend stuff instead of having to do lists? promotions all the time, get a, you know, increasing recommendation rate. Do you have a process in place for that to increase the K factor, you know, the percent of people yeah. that are recommending you? Um, I think when we first, here's an interesting thing I didn't say before, but when we first started, so pre-acquisition, um, we had actually spent like $100 on marketing in two and a half years. And our sole marketing strategy was this viral sharing thing. So we were just like, the better we can make our product, the more that people will tell other people, and that's better than any other way of distribution. Mm -hmm. So we really focus on our guides and the quality of each trip so that every time someone came away from a trip, they were like, I want to tell 10 of my friends. And we use Facebook a lot too. Like we tag photos of people, and then obviously, you know, like you see a picture of your friend with a machine gun, and you're like, what did you do this weekend? And they're like, oh, well, there's this company okay, so you, that you, takes you do a lot with shooting. that. Hmm? You, so you do a lot with, with that, getting that. Yeah. You, you do a lot with getting that rate up, yeah. people recommending it. Okay, what, what, do you want, what do you want right now in your business that you don't have? Uh, well, I wanted sleep, but now I have that a little bit more. Yeah. Um, what do I want that we don't have? 
I mean, it sounds like you're firing at all cylinders. I'm not seeing where we can help you. Here. Yeah, I want hiring. I need city managers and a lot of them quickly. Okay. And um, what what have you done to recruit or, or recruit recruiters or find people yeah, to help you recruit recruiters? Yeah, we have recruiters who, you know, obviously post in all the places like Monster and Craigslist and wherever else. Um, but I think it's a network thing. Like, again, we interviewed people who just applied and just didn't get nearly the results that we got with people from networks. So, yeah, where do we find good people? Yeah, well, it sounds like you need to build your competency for selecting recruiters and selecting recruiting processes and then selecting talent and maybe even managing that talent out once you get them on board if you need them, if you need to. But it sounds like you might already have that in place. And there's a lot out there to help with that. It is a big challenge. And it sounds yeah. like that's the... You know, your theme for the next couple quarters is, is recruiting. Yeah. And, so tell uh, your I would friends. recommend um, smart top grading, which I recommended before. Uh -huh. And uh, just talking to a lot of people who do it for a living, who recruit, so you can go through that discovery phase yeah. of uh, building your recruiting competency in your business. Um, where, where do I go to do the shooting and the drinking? <laughs> Talk to Ben. It's out back, I think. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> South Philly. Um, thank you very much, Maya and Sam. Great. We hope you enjoyed this program from the Founder Factory. For more information, visit phillystartupleaders.org. We produce this program in the studios of Professional Podcasts in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. For everyone at the Philly Startup Leaders and Founder Factory, this is Steve Lubetkin. Thank you for joining us, and take good care.